If your creative push has helped you, you can help the show by shopping on Amazon.com. All you have to do is head to yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. That will take you right there, and you can shop how you normally would. A small percentage of your purchases will go directly to helping cover the costs of creating, hosting, and maintaining your creative push. And especially with the holidays coming up, you can make a big difference just by buying the things you're going to anyway. Again, that's yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. And thank you for thinking of the show and for helping out. Your Creative Push, episode 173. Fear is what holds us back, and if you're fearful in life, you won't enjoy it and you won't do the things that you're probably brought here to do. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Renee Kaoet. Renee is a talented fine artist who has lived between Boston and Paris, France for the past five years, studying fine art and art history. She has traveled throughout Europe and North America, researching artwork ranging from the primitive and ancient to contemporary arts. Renee has exhibited throughout the United States and France, including Paris, New York City, Boston, Vermont, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And Renee, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I was wondering, can we start out by talking a little bit about how you um, kind of got to the point you are uh, today in your artistic career? Yeah, and thank you for having me. Of course. So it's kind of an interesting story. I mean, everyone's story is unique and different, but mine started out as... Well, let me start by saying I never really wanted to be an artist. (laughs) And what I mean by that is not like, oh, I think it would be awful, but I just never really had any interest in being a fine artist. Mm. So the story is that I went for my undergrad in art history, and then from there I wanted to have the fastest track to being a college professor because I thought that that would be something fun to do and I thought it would keep me relevant and in the art field Mm -hmm. so then I went for my MFA at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco so I could be a studio professor and in doing that I kind of fell into being a fine artist and I had some great mentors along the way who really wanted me to stick with being an artist and trying that route instead. I had a great conversation with the director of my department and he mentioned to me that he knows I'm putting all this effort into applying to be a professor and doing the academic route, but he thought I should really stick with maybe trying being an artist because he thinks it would be a waste. And people have mentioned that to me like throughout my entire life, really. (laughs) <laughs> now that I think about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. So I, it just kind of snowballed into doing what I'm doing now. That's cool. And was it a scary thing to to kind of make that decision to, to kind of go that route? Because I, I know that sometimes it's as easy as getting that one comment. Like I had that from one of my professors my senior year taking an elective in, in English, a, a, writing, a creative writing course. And then that kind of propelled me to not make a career in writing, but to have that be a, like a part of my life. So was it like a scary thing for you to kind of make that decision to to go at it full force? Well, there wasn't like a one aha moment mm-hmm. where I actually was like, okay, either today I'm going to be an artist or not. But the way it unfolded was um, after listening to my director and like, you know, looking at a plan and saying, well, if I do this, this and this and X, Y, and Z, then I could probably make it work. And I might as well, I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, then I have uh, my master's to fall on and, you know, pursue something else. And I guess the one thing I kept telling myself is, tomorrow is a different day. And just because I'm doing, you know, taking that leap and being a full-time artist doesn't mean that the world's going to end if it doesn't work out. So you just kind of have to like keep that in the forefront of your mind. Like every day is different and things change all the time. You know, if you're really passionate and you want to do something, then I honestly believe you have to just do it because you're going to end up doing it anyway. Mm. For example... 
like I'm a fine artist right now because, you know, I think I was really meant to do that. <laughs> so Yeah, and I think you kind of said it perfectly because I think a lot of people, that, that fear of the unknown, of, you know, of failure, it's like this like falling off a cliff type of thing where you can't come back from it. But human beings are very versatile. And, you know, like you said, if you do, if it doesn't work out perfectly exactly how you thought it would, um, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, it's not like you're going to die. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Like you said, fear is the, um, fear is what holds us back. And if you're fearful in life, then you won't enjoy it. You know, you won't enjoy it and you won't do the things that you're probably brought here to do. So just keep going, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I think uh, when you're afraid of something, that's like a sign from the universe that you're supposed to do it. Um, I think like <laughs> yeah. the, the more scared you are of something, the more you're supposed to do it. And that's like a really good signal kind of from the universe that this is the path that you should be going down, actually. So it's like going towards that fear instead of running away from it. Yeah. Tough love. <laughs> Um, you have this mantra, onwards and upwards. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think I started saying that more and more like in my head <laughs> and in my life. After I graduated from high school, I went into Pratt University for a semester up in Brooklyn. And I wanted to try being an architect because I figured it was still a creative field and it was, you know, something I really enjoyed researching and realized I didn't like it, <laughs> at mm -hmm. least as a career. I still love architecture. And I think if you look at my work, you can see that in there. And I went through a really hard time because, you know, when you're 18 and you're just starting to think of the possibilities of what you're going to do for the rest of your life, you kind of have like a little existential crisis <laughs> as I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I just had to tell myself those words like really just came to me in my head. It was like onwards and upwards. You can't, if you stay in this mind state of thinking you can't do things and that you can't achieve anything and that maybe you don't know who you are just because you don't like this one thing, then you're never going to get anywhere. And if you're stagnant, like if you're stagnant physically and I think mentally, then you really, you can't move forward. And as long as you're moving and you're doing things and the same thing in my painting practice, it's like I usually have three paintings going on at the same time because if I'm not moving onwards and seeing things and the different paintings and comparing things and just keeping my mind going and also, you know, physically like people, I don't know, but. I never thought painting was as physical as it is. I mean, I'm pretty mm. short. I'm only 5'3", and I weigh like 100 pounds maybe. And I work on canvases that are quite large, so you have to like, you know, really reach for it sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, the onwards and upwards thing is more of like a, a reminder and also, like you said, a mantra. And I always find myself thinking that way in like a, keep moving forward and in a positive light and you know it's really helped me to stay on track with what I want to do yeah I love that that mindset and and I like that idea of you know having three things going on at the same time three paintings at the same time because you know if you're sticking with one and you get stuck a little bit on it or um, it just isn't as exciting. Uh, it's good to have something else to kind of look forward to almost. It's like something else started that you can, you know, you can move on to, especially if you do get stuck. So you don't get kind of stagnant on that one thing. You can kind of move back and forth and, and stay inspired. I think that's like pretty good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, now in your paintings, you attempt to look at um, important themes through the eyes of millennials. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about like how you portray things from the eyes of, uh, of a millennial and, and why that's important to you? Yeah, I'd actually love to talk about my latest piece that I'm working on. It's about 60% done and it's called Searching for Your Roses Since You've Been Kissing the Sky. And I always like in my paintings to have a part that is like a ubiquitous theme that you know, people can relate to on a general level, like in an audience. 
mm-hmm. not like literal symbolism, but more of something like more of a broad general theme like marriage or, you know, some sort of social um, like equality or women's rights. And then I also have a lot of personal symbolism that is in the paintings and some things I'll probably never tell people what they I know a painting is really about for me, but I like to have that duality of the personal and also, you know, more universal themes so that I can comment on things that I think are very relevant. And so for this painting, the roses painting, it's commenting on how a lot of people I've talked to my age, a lot of my friends, also a lot of people I've just met or people who I know have gotten married, like what that is to them. Not only like why they get married, why they want to or why they don't want to, but what that like means to them now in terms of, you know, being someone who's a 20 or 30 something and coming into this age that's kind of crazy I don't know it's like a lot of things are changing and I feel you know like we're talking today and there's the election going on and like marriage I feel like has evolved in such an interesting way like during in the middle ages and the renaissance I feel like it was more political or economical and maybe after talking to my mother about it for her generation it was more traditional or maybe even religious and I feel like my uh, contemporaries, like my friends who are in their 20s and 30s who are deciding to get married or not get married, it's a big question. And I don't think it's just because I'm a woman. Like I think for also my male friends as well, it's something that we think about because it's not, I just don't think, at least for me, I don't think it's as relevant as it used to be or it's evolved into something that's not a tradition or like a necessity within our social um climate i guess Mm. i don't know like people live together and save money there's not really a need to like do that i think as much as there used to be and also like on the personal level uh i like lost my dad a couple years ago and you know there's thank you there's like that dream of when you're a little girl like having your dad walk you down the aisle Mm -hmm. and like having your dad approve of, you know, whoever you marry and then having, um, you know, he's giving you away, walking you down the aisle. So for me, it really changed, um, how I thought about it, you know, in my dad's passing, it brought up all these emotions about like, well, if I get married and, you know, he'll never meet that person. And also, I don't know. It's just the meaning has changed for me. And I think that that's something that I've talked to a few of my friends and also artist friends about, and they, you know, feel similar. So this piece is about like the piece is me standing in a wedding dress and I'm looking out at the viewer with kind of like this, almost like, like a searching look, like a looking out into not for approval, but like for kind of like a sign, I guess, or like an I'm trying to figure it out at this moment. And then there is a the shadow is supposed to allude to the shape of a grave. And that's like for the, there's a couple things I think that symbolizes. One could be like the death of an antiquated tradition of marriage and also um, personally for my dad. And then also there's like these roses on the wallpaper for, you know, roses are a symbol of love and also something that you see at weddings, you see them at funerals. So it's kind of like this cyclical composition that I think, well, I can't wait to finish it, but (laughs) that's what that one's about. (laughs) I can't wait to see it. Um, you're, you're an amazing painter, but you're also good at painting a, a picture for the viewer <laughs> just with your words. I can like, oh, already see thank it. You. <laughs> but, thank uh, you. So like when you, well, first of all, I agree with you about the whole, um, that with millennials, like a lot of social issues have kind of changed or are in the process of changing. And I think it is important to kind of have a voice for that and try to kind of discover, um, why it's changing and like why we feel the way we do about, you know, certain things and, 
and and how they go um but so like when that you mentioned like the grave part of it or like the shadow of a of a grave um mm-hmm. is that something that comes in into your mind like oh i need to put this there like or do you think like oh i have these these things that i want to incorporate into the painting then you find a way to incorporate does that make sense does that question make sense like yeah. does, does the image come or does it like something that you try to find yeah, kind of like chicken and the egg, which comes first, like right, the idea. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the idea or, well, I found that for me, it works both ways. A lot of the time when I'm composing a painting, I'll have the idea of what the message that I really want to convey and also the conceptual bits and the universal and the personal symbolism. And then from there, I really like to trust in my process, which every art teacher in the world will tell you, you have mm-hmm. to trust in the process. And <laughs> But I found that in doing that, things can evolve organically more, especially if you spend more time off of the canvas. So when I compose a painting, it's all in my head. And then what I do is I'll take concept photos of references of things that I need, like roses or shadows or a wedding dress. And then from there, I'll do thumbnail sketches, and then I'll do a little oil study. And then from there, I'll go on to the painting in that way. So I explain to people that I probably spend 70% of the time doing research and composing the painting off the canvas. And then I probably only spend 30% of my work time actually painting because it goes faster when you have it all figured out Mm -hmm. so like for the grave bit I'll use that as an example that happened during I remember exactly it was I was doing a thumbnail of it and I was drawing the shadow in and I remember thinking oh that looks like a grave Mm -hmm. and then the whole my whole concept just like came together the marriage part the personal part about the death the, you know, it could be a symbol for the antiquated tradition of marriage. Like, is it still relevant? So it's kind of like it all happens at once sometimes. Sometimes it happens on the way. So, you know, sometimes I need to see it first before I can actually understand what I'm completely making, if that mm. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. And what does that feel like whenever you have that like thing where it just like clicks and it's just all like comes together like that moment? Uh, it's the best feeling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's in my head, I call it the magic. That's when the magic mm. happens. It's like, you're not like figuring something out. Like I think of painting as a problem solving for, you know, the composition part and, You know, there's a lot of math and all that involved, but the magic is when it just kind of, it all feels good. The conceptual part, the physical part of making it, and, you know, it's just that satisfaction, I guess. Yeah, I'm uh, for people listening, they know I'm obsessed with magic and, like, just like (laughs) that, like the magic of the universe where it just feels like everything's right and, like, uh, it just clicks. And uh, I think that that's something that, like transcends all kind of creative fields. Like it can happen with writing. It can happen with music. It can happen with art. It's like this, this connection. And I think that's what, uh, you know, art and, and creativity is all about. It's finding that connection with like the, the world yourself and the universe, like when it all kind of comes together. Yeah. I mean, we're similar. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. Yeah. <that's> good. <laughs> um, you also, whole travel is very important too. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because you've seen a lot of the world. Yeah, I've worked really hard and I've, you know, kind of fashioned my life into having travel as a big part of that. And I credit my parents' divorce to like, you know, being able to be comfortable in moving around a lot. And I Mm. think a lot of times my parents feel... Uh, guilty about getting divorced just because I think their generation was kind of taboo to do that, even if it was for the better. But I actually thank them for it for many reasons. Mm -hmm. But one of them is because it gave me this ability to be comfortable wherever I am because I had to travel to see my dad and go back and forth between 
my parents' house and my grandparents' houses. And I really appreciated being able to see new surroundings and acclimate myself to uh, wherever I was at any time. And so from there, my whole life, I've kind of moved around a lot, like from Boston to New York and then living in Paris for about four or five years and then coming back to Boston. And I think being able to see things visually and take them in like a sponge is one of the most important learning uh, things that you could do. While I was in my undergrad, I was an art history major, so I wasn't, you know, like I said, I wasn't even doing any artwork at the time. But I feel like that was the time when I learned the most about painting because I was in Paris studying and seeing all this, not only artwork, but also different places. And while I was in Paris, I was there for a while. So I traveled to Italy, I traveled to Austria, I traveled through Germany, um, through Holland a lot. Spain was a big influence on me. Um, so you see like these other artists, but you also understand a culture and you get different points of views and you can, you know, and I love to talk to people. So, you know, and even in talking to people, you become like a sponge and you just, that was the most inspiring and like learning artistically was mostly from traveling and experiencing like experiencing things in life, I think, is that's what life's about, I guess. <laughs> but it's one of the biggest influences on at least my artwork. And I think other artists could say that as well. Yeah. Like you're saying before about like being stagnant just with your, you know, your art. It's like being stagnant in life, too. If, if you just kind of stay put in the same kind of corner of the globe and just don't really leave like a 10 mile radius like you're entire life or only once or twice in your life and and kind of like you're saying you know onwards and upwards you know like you gotta like go explore and see other things and kind of soak things up like you said like a sponge and that's the only way to like kind of get that that source material for for your art for your whatever your creative passion is but also just as a human being you know to to experience what's out there you know because there's so much yeah there's a lot and like those people who stay at home and you know, who don't leave the 10 mile radius, like that's what they do. And that's fine. But for me, yeah, like you said, it's just, that's how I feel my work is with my experiences. Yeah. And I mean, that is what they do. And that's, you know, it's, it's tough like to get the money and like find time off from work and just make everything work. But sometimes you just have to make that decision to do it because you don't realize the importance of it until like after it's over, you know? So it's like, you kind of have to get a little bit uncomfortable with, you know, either financially or, you know, schedule wise and just kind of make it work to, to go see the world. I think it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, are there any resistances that you have kind of on a daily basis um, or a weekly basis or or whatever, like things that hold you back from actually being creative? Well, there's always the voice in the back of your head that says, like, this is awful. (laughs) This painting (laughs) isn't going to be good, you know, and... Hmm. I mean, everyone has that in life and especially I think artists because it's part of their work and they have to sit with themselves and their work every day. You know, there's also like financial, you have to really prioritize and be smart with your budget and the way it works, at least my business model is most of my commissions, my private commissions pay for the time that I spend in the studio for me to work on my own work and that can be hard sometimes because commissions can be time consuming and also take longer than you think and Mm -hmm. um, be unpredictable. So like there's the doubt part and there's also, I would say my other biggest resistance would be probably just the fear, (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. the fear of like, you know, and these are questions and things that I have come up in my head. And I know everyone listening has probably had them in some way, but it's like the fear of not being good enough, but also what if what I'm doing isn't worth it? Or like, you know, how am I going to sell this? Or, you know, all those questions of 
how are you going to do this and how are you going to make this work kind of come into play with the doubt and the fear. But, um, you know, that's where onwards and upwards comes in. And it's, Mm -hmm. you know, the thing that I say to myself when that those thoughts start to come into my head. And there's also like, I don't know how much time we have, but (laughs) all the time in the world. Okay. Like a big part of what holds me back, I think is, like because my dad passed away a couple of years ago, it's been like really an interesting journey because he passed away and he didn't um, before I started painting really. So he hasn't seen any of my artwork, which is like some days I'll just have to really sit with that mm. and, um, you know, kind of, it's like a double edged sword because I can like feel this intense support and love from him all the time. But I can also feel like, you know, the sadness and the grief and the like this kind of tug of war that goes on within myself. And like, no one's ever like, no one can see it. Like if this is happening (laughs) for me, like emotionally Mm -hmm. on an emotional level, it's just kind of, um, you know, some days are, some days are up and down and it's, um, kind of something I'm trying to figure out between like being happy. It's like bittersweet being happy about what I'm working on and also honoring my dad's memory. Like a lot of my paintings are about my dad and I think a lot of them have him in there in some way. And they're also, um, like a response to my love for him that kind of is unseen and I can't physically give. (laughs) Mm. So it's like, and also like, you know, I don't know. It's, um, that's a big part for me. And that's a very personal part that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to who have lost people in their lives. But some days it's hard to work and there's a big resistance in myself and, feeling like I'm doing everything I can be doing, I guess. Right. Yeah. And then do you find like when those thoughts come in, do you find that that like, does that influence the actual piece itself? Or like, I know you do a lot of planning beforehand, but then um, when you get that kind of ebb and flow, the ups and the downs and those kinds of thoughts that come into your head, does that ever make you kind of switch things up and maybe um, influence the work in in, in any way? Yeah. And it's always a positive thing. I mean, mm-hmm. everything, everything is always a positive thing, even if you don't know it yet, <laughs> right. like in your life, you know, it's weird. It might sound weird for me to say this, but in ways I think that if my dad hadn't passed away at the time that he did, then maybe I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now because in seeing how fast life can just leave and how fast your life can change it really gave me this I don't know feeling of I have to like carpe diem like I just have to do this I just have to seize moments in life and do whatever I want even if it upsets people or even if it is a risk and that really helps me do I think a lot of the things that I and make a lot of the decisions that I make and keep going in the direction that I'm going with my work because I feel like life is short and you have to be grateful and you have to think of every moment as a gift. And I think that my dad's gift that he keeps on giving to me from wherever he is, is that he um, supports me and he, he gave me that feeling of, I just need to do this and I need to keep going and I need to go you know, move onwards and upwards and life is short. So you just have to do what you need to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And kind of that that's the whole basis for the for this podcast is that, you know, seize the day because you can go from one day to the next just thinking, oh, I'll do this tomorrow or I'll get to this passion tomorrow, this thing that I've always wanted to do or this way that I've always wanted to put myself out there or even to travel to places, you know, like, if you keep pushing it off, like 
time can go really fast <laughs> and all of a sudden you're you're looking back at you know a three-year gap in your art a 10-year stagnant period where you're just not really doing anything except for you know making some money at your job and, and just watching tv all day or, or just thinking about the thing that you're not doing and i think it is so important to you know like you said seize the day and um unfortunately sometimes it takes an event like that a, you know a tragedy like that to kind of spring you into action so hopefully people can you know learn from from what you're saying yeah thanks yeah i think it's um yeah like you said unfortunate but it's welcome because it's what what makes life life and you just have to keep going yeah <laughs> for sure now, I was wondering, uh, do you have a, a formula for balancing your limited time <laughs> since we're talking about time? Yeah, I I have certain days that I do certain things. Like on Mondays, I will always, like I do have a rigid schedule, but it's also open to change. So like Mondays, I usually try and get all my planning and all of my, oh, I'm going to do this this day and get my schedule in order and also do any what I call computer work, which is like updating <laughs> websites or, right. um, you know, designing flyers for a show or, you know, any of things like that. And then I also have like one day a month that I try and go on to all like the, I'm a member of the college art association and try and go on to the websites that have like information for artists about things happening in the area and also um, calls for entries for shows and uh, anything to do with scheduling things like that. And then there's also, I try to paint a little bit every day and some days I paint all day, but really that depends on how the rest of my schedule is during the week. Like yesterday I painted for a solid amount of time, but then for the whole week before that, I was getting ready for two shows and putting together travel plans for going down to Miami Art Basel. So I didn't nice. really get any work done <laughs> in terms of painting. <laughs> right. But it evens out. And like, if there's any advice I could give, it would be like, don't get overwhelmed. Mm. Uh, you just have to organize the chaos of, <laughs> <laughs> of your schedule and being an artist. And then, you know, just let it flow because like when you essentially run your own business, there's, there's a lot to do. And as long as it looks effortless, then <laughs> you're fine, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, no business is perfect and no one is perfect. So yeah, it's when things get chaotic and like you said, the, there's so much, so many more things than you kind of anticipate that there will be a lot of busy work, a lot of computer work, <laughs> um, uh, it is important to organize that chaos in the best way possible. And I think that just putting things down on a calendar, like you said, like every Monday, just getting it down. And it, as long as you can kind of have it planned out, then it's not necessarily spinning through your head all the time. And you can, when it time, when it's time to get creative, you know, you can kind of have an open mind to, to be able to do that, a clear head to, to do that. Um, do you adhere to your schedule all the time? Like, uh, like you set the schedule on Monday, but then do you have to like audible a lot or do you sometimes skip over things? Are you good at sticking to the schedule that you've set for yourself? I'm really committed to the idea of sticking to my schedule. <laughs> and then from there, like if like priorities set in. So during the sure. week, like if something comes up, like someone asked me to be in a group show last minute and I have to get, you know, all the paperwork in and all the labels and whatever, then something has to be moved and, you know, priorities have to be taken into account in terms of time and when things have to be done. As long as something is written down somewhere, and I don't just mean in my iCal, in my phone. Mm. I mean, I have to write things down because if I don't see it and I don't have like the muscle memory of writing it, then I'll probably just forget it. And then that's when I get into trouble. But in general, I, I stick to a schedule because that's just how I function. But I, I have plenty of friends who just do day to day which mm. works for them. It, it's really all up to how you're 
brain works and how good your memory is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm the same way. If I don't write it down right away, I will forget. Yeah. <laughs> so Google calendars has saved my life on multiple occasions. I think it's also important to put put things down on a calendar too, um, especially if you're of the lazier <laughs> mindset. Because mm-hmm. that just like makes makes it a thing that you have to do as opposed to this like kind of ethereal thing just floating around like I'll get to that at some point like we were talking about before because that can just you know if it's not written down it can just go on forever it can go on to next year <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you, you never get to it so it kind of I don't know it keeps you keeps you motivated to to actually do it yeah all right Renee it's time for the final push And this is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best words of advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. Okay. All right. I feel a big responsibility. But (laughs) um, All right, listener, if there's anything that I have to say for being a creative person full time and jumping into that scary world, (laughs) um, it's not that scary, I guess, is my biggest message and that not again with what we were saying in the beginning about fear getting in the way don't let yourself be your biggest enemy don't get in your own way of your work and of your outlook on your work and just be mindful and um, if you ever have a negative thought or something that's really bothering you just leave it, you know, leave it in your head, look at it, think about, well, why don't I feel like I can work or why do I think this painting isn't good or why, you know, and don't get stuck there. You know, just you have to keep moving. If you get stuck on something or if you're afraid of doing something, then you have to move on to something else because the physical energy and the mental like path of just keep moving and not being stagnant and not being afraid to do what you want to do, even if it's the littlest thing, like going to sharpen a pencil. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Don't get stuck in the fear and don't let anything get in your way, I guess is my message. (laughs) Yeah. Don't get stuck onwards and upwards. Mm -hmm. Renee, thank you so much for, for being on the show today and for giving us that push. Oh, thank you. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Of course. Uh, and you can find Renee on her website, which is com. That's R-E-N-E-E-C-A-O-U-E-T-T-E.com. Uh, on Instagram, she is Renee Kaowet Art. And on Facebook, she is Kaowet.Renee. Um, and we'll have all those links to everything we talked about at yourcreativepush.com slash Renee, R-E-N-E-E. Renee, thanks again. Thank you. My thank you to Renee for coming on the show onwards and upwards folks like renee said just repeating this mantra this this mindset to yourself is so important so you don't get stuck in that mind state where you're just in this loop of those existential questions rolling around in your head coming back over and over you have to push past that and the best part of that mindset onwards and upwards um, in my opinion is that As long as you keep moving onwards, as long as you keep moving forward, you will move upwards as well. It's one of those benefits of momentum, one of those benefits of just keep on moving on. As you progress forward, you progress upwards, even though it doesn't always feel that way. You know, I imagine those graphs from the stock market where you have the peaks and valleys and the graph either moves up or down, but I think with creativity, as long as you are moving in that direction towards the right of that graph, you are going to be moving up. You are going to be trending upwards. It's almost impossible not to be because even when you're failing in certain aspects, even when you have those dips, those valleys where you just screwed up and you feel terrible about what you're doing, you're going to get past that as long as you keep moving forward, as long as you learn from those failures, from those mistakes, you put them behind you and you keep moving forward. It's so important. It's important for sure to learn from those those valleys, from those dips, from the mistakes you made, but it's more important to keep moving forward and the graph will always move up And then when you have a long period of time where you keep moving forward every single day, you can look back to see how far you've come. 
how much your uh, <laughs> stock has grown uh, since you first started. I'm not saying that every day is going to be a perfect day. Every day is going to be an upward trend. But as long as you go to tomorrow with the positive mindset that you are on this long path, this long path of success that doesn't care about the short-term failures, it's just concerned with you giving yourself to it every single day, then you are going to be in a much better place come one month, come one year, come 10 years, and you are going to be off the charts for uh, <laughs> lack of better terms. Uh, but that is all I've got for you today. Hopefully you are inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done, and we will be here for you on Thursday if you need that push again. But until then, go and get some amazing work done. I love you all, and we will see you then. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.